Good morning and welcome. Nice to be with here with you on this beautiful coolish fallish day, but the sun is shining. A warm welcome is extended to Reg Porter, who has come today, this special birthday of Trinity, to offer the reflection. And a sincere welcome to those who are joining us through Eastlink this morning. And a thank you is extended to those operating the cameras and greeting at the door. A sincere thank you to Donnie Fraser and the Trinity Choir for their contribution to the music for this special service this morning. Please join us today after worship in the gym for a time of fellowship. And other announcements in our bulletin. Today's bulletins are in loving memory of Ivo Cudmore, presented by Eunice and family. Happy birthday today to Phil Floyd, to Clive Cudmore on November the 27th, and to Eunice Cudmore on November the 30th. Many thanks to Linda Dunning and Debbie McLeod for their enthusiastic, tireless leadership of the Christmas Fair for so many years, their organizational skills and caring support of the many volunteers contribute significantly to making the fair a huge financial success and an enjoyment, enjoyable event. Trinity is seeking a volunteer for the fire safety plan and the information is available from Graeme Linkletter. Ne uh, December the 8th will be white gift service and please keep that in mind. The directions are printed in your bulletin. And the Sherwood unit of the UCW, their meeting is this Tuesday, November the 26th at 10 o'clock here in the church parlor. Congratulations to Ellen Locke Durong, our church office administrator, is now officially a licensed lay worship leader. So congratulations to her. And the Trinity UCW annual meeting and dinner, the information is in your bulletin. That will be December the 9th at the Quality Inn on the Hill. Please contact Miriam Lank or Ann Love for more information. United Church calendars are available in the church office for $10 each. And I asked Alma Much to speak, please. Good morning. On behalf of the Christian Development Committee and the Sunday School children and their teachers, I want to remind you about our angel tree. Once again, beginning Sunday, December 1st until December 22nd, uh, we, will be, uh, we will have uh, memorial angels and angels of honor at the Richmond Street entrance before church. We are asking for a donation of $5 for each angel. Your angel will be placed on the tree by the Sunday school students and uh, it, they, will be, your, uh, they will be read aloud, the names. Uh, last year, this project generated $805, and the children chose gifts from the United Church Gifts and Vision Catalog for people in need. Some of their choices were registration for a youth camp for an indigenous youth, a bus pass for a month in Victoria, school supplies to Kenya, Zambia, and Philippines, uh, gift cards for food in the north, hot meals for 60 in St. John's, a bull calf for women's cooperative in Kenya. These are just some of the purchases that the children chose. This project is very important as outreach for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Alma. The lighting of our Christ candle. Time passing, that is the reason for anniversaries, for drawing together past experiences and people and events and for honoring the faith community already taken. We remember with gratitude, we acknowledge gifts given and received, 
This morning, we hold up 155 years of Trinity United Church in which this community of faith has lived and served as disciples of Jesus Christ. An anniversary is an occasion to acknowledge that grace does not change with time. We light this candle, naming that timeless grace, calling us, nurturing us, and leading us into tomorrow. The lighting of the rainbow candle. We light the rainbow candle to acknowledge the amazing diversity of all creation. All that has life is sacred, all creatures of the land, the seas, the sky, and people so diverse in our culture and language, our sense of identity and our abilities. Yet we are only part of that intricate web of life woven together in breathtaking beauty, one shade among many in creation's rainbow. As we gather to worship, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abiquit Mi'kmaq First Nations. May we live with respect on this land and live in peace with its peoples. To celebrate 155 years is to celebrate a long life as a faith community. This has been years and years of hard work, prayer for worship, and terrific spiritual care. Our time of worship and gathering has begun. We are still young. We are just beginning. We have only caught a glimpse of what the Spirit is calling us to be. As we celebrate our past, let us also rejoice in the holy ground that lies before us. Let us ask for courage, energy, and purpose. Let us ask for wisdom, faith, and guidance as we walk this road together. Our opening hymn is number 326, O Four A Thousand Tongues to Sing. This hymn was written by Charles Wesley, the greatest hymn writer of Methodism who wrote more than 6,000 hymns. And this hymn was first used in an open air service in England.
continuing to worship God, our opening prayer is on the page of top of page three. We thank you, loving Divine One, for all those who before us have lived in the faith and now live with you. Our faith can guarantee the blessings that we hope for. It was for faith that our ancestors worked so hard to establish this faith community. With so many witnesses, we now call upon your abiding attention, love, and guidance that we too may continue to be your faithful people through the upcoming years. We ask all of this and also pray the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now as we prepare for the time with the children, please remain seated as we sing number 357, verses 1, 2, and 3. morning. How are you this morning? Are you good? And what do you do when you have a birthday? What? Do you celebrate, but how do you celebrate? Oh, she getting right to the cake. <laughs> Girl after my own heart. What else do you do? Do you invite friends? Yeah, yeah, you invite friends and you have family. You have a party, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, so this church is 155 years old. Isn't that amazing? So I have a, it, you probably get gifts, so I have a gift bag here. So what might be in this gift bag? Hmm? Do you also have party favorites? Uh, now I thought those would make all kinds of noise, but uh, I tried one and I was disappointed. <laughs> I want to make lots of noise. Huh? Yeah. There's got to be a way to make them make all kinds of noise. You got it. <laughs> She's got it. Yeah. So what else do we do? 
Do we sing happy birthday? Huh? You have to blow really hard, you have to have all kinds of wind. Huh? <laughs> so, do we sing happy birthday? Yeah, let's sing happy birthday to Trinity. Hmm? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Trinity. Happy birthday to you. Now, don't let that disrupt your Sunday school class. <laughs> or I'll be in trouble. Also, there's something else in here, and the parents will just love me for giving you this. Little chocolate cupcakes. I've been baking all night. No, <laughs> thanks to Sobeys. So you take those and share them. Maybe even let your teachers have one. All right, so I'll just put it in the bag, and somebody can carry it down to Sunday school. Do I need to take those back? <laughs> no. <laughs> All righty, you have a good time in Sunday school. Will you take this down? Thank you. Our prayer of confession, let us pray that together. We confess that on occasions such as this, it's so much easier to look back rather than look forward. We appreciate the work of our ancestors in the faith, and we assume it was easier or more satisfying in their time. We forget the cost the sacrifice and the hard work that brought this community of faith to where it is today. Help us to look forward and to work forward, knowing that the same spirit that enabled past generations also enables us. Amen. Let us always live a more godly existence, accepting forgiveness and grace and offering them to others. As we envision what this church still has to offer to this community of faith and out into the world, we are so grateful for this forgiveness offered freely to us. Let us pray. Our Divine One loves you no matter what. That grace washes over you and works to restore relationships and brings new hope. May it be so. Amen. Our congregational psalm is number 91, found on page 807 in Voices United. You who dwell in the shelter of your God, 
who abides in God's shadow for life. The snare of the fowler will never capture you, and famine will bring you no fear. Under God's wings, your refuge, God's faithfulness, your shield. And I will raise you up. You need not fear the terror of the night, nor the hour that flies by day. Though thousands fall about you, near to you it shall not come. For to the angels is given a command to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Because they have set their love upon me, I will deliver them. I will uphold them because they know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them in trouble. I will rescue and bring them to honor. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my saving power. And a short reading from Ephesians. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. And from Hebrews 12. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the high hand of the throne of God. These readings from Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Now I'll ask Norman Carruthers to introduce our guest speaker. Good morning. It is a great pleasure for me this morning to have the opportunity of introducing the 155th anniversary service guest speaker, Reginald Porter. Reg was educated at Loyola College in Montreal, Mount Allison University in New Brunswick, and the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, Greece. He has taught at such institutions as Mount Allison University and the University of Prince Edward Island. He is now retired and resides in Bell River, PEI. Reg has, over the years, obtained a well-deserved reputation as a noted authority on Prince Edward Island history and architecture. He was the guest speaker here in 2015 at the anniversary service when he gave a wonderful presentation on the stained glass windows in this sanctuary. He had just completed a catalog on all the stained glass windows in this church. He has since then completed another book about Trinity. This book is about the architectural history of Methodism in Charlottetown. As Sally Cole said in her write-up in yesterday's edition of The Guardian, it is an art historical view of the evolution of the building, meaning the first in 1816 Methodist Chapel the Isaac Smith Greek Revival Chapel in 1835, and then this church, which was called the Brick Chapel at the time of its construction in 1863 to 1864, some 155 years ago. Some people have referred to this church as the grand old lady on Prince Street. Reg Porter will now tell us about the architecture of Methodism in Charlottetown. Good morning. It is with great pleasure and a sense of honor that I'm standing in this pulpit here before you on this 155th anniversary of the completion of the sanctuary. I want to give you a brief summary of how I came to write this manuscript that uh, we are presenting to you today. My background has been in the history of art. And I tend to look at my environment in the manner of an art historian. And that is that, am I inaudible? 
there. Am I more audible now? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I, when I look at buildings and all sorts of other things in the world in which I live, because of a lifetime of automatically applying the way art historians look, not only at art, but at architecture, things start to speak to me. The buildings themselves have secrets and mysteries and stories, all of which are to be found in their detail and also in their placement in the geography or the topography of the place where they are found. The history of the architecture of Methodism in Charlottetown is one that is rooted in the amazing 18th century. The 18th century was one of the most exciting periods in the history of Western civilization. There was a movement called the Enlightenment that swept through all of Europe and which was the result partly of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century that had taken away, had removed many of the strictures and limitations that had been placed on the free, uninhibited pursuit of knowledge by the Catholic Church in the previous 10 centuries. It was now possible for research as we understand it, based on observable, demonstrable principles, could take place. And so the 18th century, as well as being the time of late Bach and Handel, Mozart in music, it was also a period of great popular learning. It was the period when the first encyclopedias summarizing everything that was known in human knowledge in sets of books which people could buy and could study. And the mysteries of the Middle Ages began to be pushed back and it became possible for new ideas in science on the screens, I have projected a dark picture. It may not be tremendously clear to you in the, in the bright sanctuary, but the first is a painting by Joseph Wright of Derby, one of the great English painters of the Enlightenment. And it shows a family in a darkened room with scientific equipment surrounding them. The children are there. They're interested. They're terribly distressed because either a, a scientific man or the father who was interested in science is demonstrating to all that without air, things cannot live. And in this great glass globe, a bird, a family pet, no doubt, taken from the cage on the right is suffocating to death because of lack of air. It is an advancement in science. At the same time that this was happening, there was a Frenchman in France called Lavoisier who was killed by the revolution, uh, who isolated the element oxygen, which is so absolutely necessary for us to breathe in in order to live. So things tend to be connected. Another painting a few years later by Joseph Wright of Derby shows 
another group of people, a group of men this time, not a family, a group of enthusiasts, but with little children present, the scientists of the future, if you will, who are looking at a great big brass contraption that is on a table, which is actually a movable model of the solar system, where planets can move around the sun, moons can move about the planets. And it is this new understanding of astronomy that took place in the 18th century that permitted all kinds of new advances in the measuring of the Earth, in the measuring of celestial spaces, and which led ultimately later in the century to the possibility of making maps that actually looked like the territories that they represented. And one of the first maps ever made in the history of the world of a complete legal entity, territory, was of the island of St. John, which in a few years' time, in 1799, would be named Prince Edward Island. Unfortunately, this map, this photograph of Holland's map, is not projecting clearly to you because it's very, very light and there's a lot of light in the building. But as you know, in 1755, and some of you a few years ago, a few summers ago, may have gone to the Confederation Center to see his gigantic manuscript map, Samuel Holland delineated the outlines of the island more exactly than they had ever been done before. So that for the first time in the history of map making, which goes back to antiquity, the island looks the way we recognize it today. He completely ignored the geography of the French occupation which had ended with the British conquest. And he didn't for a moment consider the Aboriginal occupation, which had been probably continuous for over 10,000 years. All of that was obliterated by the beautiful design, the beautiful lines of the European Enlightenment as applied to this territory by Holland, divided into lots where all of us who were born here on the island can claim as our home and can claim as a source of identity. Incredible order was brought to this island. And that was the result of the European Enlightenment, which has no end to the different directions in which human inquiry was pushed until, for the first time in the history of humankind, answers about the world and what, what constituted its most intimate parts were presented for all to know if they cared to do so. It was also a time of adventure. The Anglican Church had been the only church called by the name church in England and indeed the world since the time of King Henry VIII and his historic break with Rome. With the monarch as the head of the church, the monarch who perhaps in his youth had been a very spiritual person. Indeed, he was. He wrote a defense of the papacy, for which he received the title Defensor Fidei, Defender of the Faith, 
which ironically our queen still has added to her titles today and which you can see on coins, DF. Um, Henry, as the head of the church, was not always a brilliant spiritual guiding light in his personal behavior and activities to the church of which he was the sole head. A certain tiredness, a certain lassitude overcame the Sunday duties of the people to gather in their churches. The services became more abbreviated and more distracted. And instead of a cross to remind us of Jesus Christ, who was the only an absolute reason that Christianity came into being in the first century, there was the royal coat of arms to remind you not of Jesus, but of the ruler of the time. And it was at times very difficult for some people to focus on the basic reasons that Christianity existed, and that was, as Max St. Mark tells us, to do good and to avoid evil. In the middle of the century, a young man went up to Oxford to take his BA, and his name was John Wesley. It was accompanied by his brother. They were young men of deep awareness. And even more than that, they were young men of astonishing conscience. Their eyes were opened to the suffering of the less privileged, which formed the great, vast, overwhelming majority of the British population. And they felt that they ought to do something about it. But before they could go out and do something about it, they decided that they would regulate their lives according to Christian principles so that at any given time in their day, they could be reminded of their savior and of their salvation. They turned their attention, these young people, they had other followers at Oxford, and because of their orderly lives, they were mocked and called the Methodists because there was a method to their day with unvarying devotion and unvarying good works as well as their studies. In order to get his degree, John Wesley had to take holy orders and he became an Anglican priest. And he went out into the world and he tried to bring comfort to the afflicted and to go beyond that to give them self-respect, and he showed a very, very great interest in education, which he felt was at the basis of raising people from animal obs obscurity to being representative samples of the glory of God. And thus began Wesleyan Methodism which spread with the most amazing speed, not only throughout the British Isles, but in North America itself. The picture on the left is a satirical engraving by the great English and, uh, artist of the Enlightenment, William Hogarth, who shows 
what is going on in a typical Anglican church. He's being nasty there. Uh, a typical na uh, Anglican church in the 18th century with a minister full from the pulpit oogling a well-endowed young lady who happened to be below. Other people in the gallery hanging over the edge with their hats snoring away while someone was reading, presumably, scripture. Wesley disapproved of this, and this disapproved of Wesley. And he and his followers had a very great difficulty, had many troubles in establishing themselves as a congregation. But it eventually happened. And in time, they were allowed to build chapels. In his travels, John Wesley encountered a young man who was training to be what was in those days called a mechanic. That is, a person who could construct any of the machinery required in the many different aspects of manufactures that formed the British Industrial Revolution, which was also a product of the European Enlightenment. And Chapel became a Wesleyan follower, and he and his wife decided to emigrate to the island of St. John <clears throat> to what is now called New London Bay, part of a settlement scheme of the most grandiose proportions you could imagine, in what on paper was a perfect harbor, protected from the terrible storms of the Gulf of St. Lawrence, inlets rivers draining into the bay where you could build dams and have mills. And Chapel became an indentured apprentice to this adventure, this adventure and settlement, one of the first and one of the most major on the island, newly divided up, newly surveyed by Samuel Holland, and part of the plan of why the survey existed. Chapel built row houses about a kilometer or so inland from the sea, parallel to the sea. He built mills. He built uh, a, a, a gong that you could strike to call people to divine service. He found a rock on the shore on which he could perch himself and below which those who followed him, those who wished to listen to him, would congregate. And he would preach to them, read to them from the Bible about the words of Jesus and the necessity of doing good and avoiding evil and to helping your neighbors. The settlement in New London Bay, as has been quite vividly described in a book by John Cousins a couple of years ago, was a total, utter disaster. And after his apprenticeship was over, Benjamin Chapel moved to Charlottetown, where he would spend the rest of his life incredibly busy as a mechanic able to construct wagons, wheels, sleighs, anything you wanted, furniture, he could construct for you, and indeed he did. <clears throat> he settled very, very close to here, just over there, a minute's walking distance from this sanctuary, on the corner of Prince and Water Street. He obtained a house there, and later on, on the north end of his lot, when he became the postmaster, he built a small post office. And an artist drew it. You can see it in the lower half of the picture 
on the screen. And in his house, Benjamin Chapel became known as someone who knew the word of God. And people began to assemble at his house. There's a letter that survives of a lady writing to ask if he would be at home, if he would be speaking some evening, because she very badly wanted to go and hear the word of God from his lips. And so in time, Methodism was established in Charlottetown, which was at that time a city of maybe two dozen houses. Tree stumps were everywhere. There was a great swamp that began at Houston and Great George Street and ran all the way halfway into Queen Square. It was a bog with, I'm sure, as many mosquitoes as we have in Bell River today. That was the Charlottetown that Chapel moved in. And so he witnessed the growth of this amazingly designed city of the Enlightenment, which was inspired in its design by Roman legionary camps in a book that was written by a man called Vitruvius, an architect who lived about the time of Christ and which had miraculously survived. And so in this special city with its origins in Roman designs, its execution in the spirit of the European Enlightenment, dominated by only one church, the Church of England, while all the other places of worship had to be designated chapels because in the eyes of the British monarchy, there was only one church. And so in this environment, uh, Chapel lived and tried to get Methodist ministers to come and preach to his growing congregation, tried desperately to build a chapel. And indeed, after great difficulties, by 1816, also within very easy walking distance off here, a two-minute walk along Richmond Street, across Queen Street, and on your right was a chapel which must have looked almost exactly like the beautiful little chapel, which is part of your charge, which survives in Southport, and which appears in the photograph on the screen. Uh, a manse was later built to accommodate a minister, and eventually a minister came. That little first little church was in the style of the time, the style of the King Georges of England, who, which was a neoclassical style. It was meant to look like a small little Roman building might have looked with trim corner boards, rectangular, formal, symmetrical. And so the church was built, but it wasn't good enough. The congregation was growing and growing. And by the 1830s, a Yorkshireman, who was also a Methodist, a man of mystery, we don't know a great deal about him, and yet he was the most prolific art architect of the 1830s and 40s. He built some of the most important houses uh, and buildings ever built on the island. The legislature, which is being <coughs> restored, was his work. Government house was his work. There were, and there were churches, in Rustico, in St. Eleanor's, and of course, the beautiful church that was just there in your lawn, built in the Greek Revival style because architecture is always changing, and the neoclassical buildings that were fairly simple, austere things, were given a heroic, majestic quality 
by the additions of extremely wide corner boards, which were called pilasters, brackets under the eaves, so that they indeed looked like Roman temples. In other provinces where the style was more advanced, they actually built churches that looked like Greek Doric temples. And the church prospered. And it soon became too small. And a section was built on at the end. And by the 1840s, it was too small. The room was bursting with Methodist worshipers. And so at a T angle to it, they built another extension. All decorated in the Greek Revival style, which is a wonderful story to study in itself. Greek Revival architecture is an exciting thing to study in Charlottetown and the environs of Charlottetown where the influence of Isaac Smith was felt. And so that was done. And then it was decided in the 1860s that the twice expanded Isaac Smith Greek Revival temple was too small. And so they decided that they would build a church. And they hired two local men, one Thomas Alley, an architect, the other Mark Butcher, a furniture maker, upholsterer, design, interior designer. And somehow or other, Thomas Alley, by imitating other churches in the Gothic Revival style, design this present sanctuary. Now, wanting to be, wanting to build in the Gothic Revival style, which was replacing and killing all the old classical styles of Europe, there had been a movement in England called the Oxford Movement. It had other names as well. But the idea was that architects came to the conclusion that the Gothic churches of the Middle Ages with their pointed arches had been the most ideal spaces to enter and sit and contemplate the mercy and the glory of God. And so the style took over. There was a problem, however, with the Methodists, who were not terribly fond of the Roman Catholic Church. They saw the papacy in Rome, the glory and splendor of the vestments and the service, even in the smallest little churches in the little communities, because it was an international system of worship where everything was prescribed and nothing was left, or very little except sermons were left to the choice of the priests. Uh, the Methodists could not cope with Gothic. But clever architects in England came along and said, well, you know, <clears throat> don't get too upset, don't get too excited, because <clears throat> Henry VIII continued to build in the Gothic style after he left the Church of Rome. And that Gothic style is called Tudor. And Tudor architecture, Tudor, Tudor Gothic, generally, and it's found all over England, in churches, in, in palaces, in, in great country houses, Tudor architecture had a great facade, a plain facade dominated usually by a huge window. And on either side of the window were two little twiddly turrets, not great big French Gothic spires and towers, <coughs> two towers that framed the window. And somehow or other, the Methodist congregation in Charlottetown 
overcame its colossal traumas, looked around, corresponded, traveled, bought books, and Thomas Alley, imitating uh, uh, a building in Portland, Maine, I think almost copying it, uh, designed this temple. And it was built in the Gothic Revival style. And so you see the Methodists are here right after Samuel Holland to get the island going. They build the first neoclassical chapel. They move with the fashion. They are so progressive, these Methodists. They move with the times, with the fashions. They build the Greek Revival chapel over here. And by 1864, this Gothic Revival, at the height of architectural style and progress, is constructed and dedicated. And we have a full account of what went on in the days of dedication. And we are standing in this space. The outside has not changed. For one brief moment, the two churches, Isaac Smith's Greek revival and Thomas Alley's Gothic revival stood side by side on Prince Street and this amazing watercolor in the Confederation Center Art Gallery Museum shows the two buildings side by side. And you can see there the drama of leaving Greek classicism to the soaring, majestic, medieval Gothic, which we enjoy today. This is the first photograph that I've been able to find, taken in 1864. You can still see a little bit of Smith's church on the left, and it was taken down in 1864. You see the church as it was meant to look. It is pure, austere, clean, Tudor Gothic. Unfortunately, you've lost the upper story of your spire, of your, your, your turrets, which is a, a very, very sad thing because it diminishes the presence of this church uh, in its setting. There should be another story on top of your turrets with uh, a proper little spiralette on top. And maybe someday you'll find the bricks fairly easy and the money with enormous difficulty to restore the church to the appearance that you see here on this photograph. This is how it was meant to look and everything is perfect except for those stunted turrets. Mark Butcher, who designed the interior, I believe, didn't know a thing about Gothic. And so in this early photograph of how it looked in 1877 when decorators from New York came to try and do something with it, none of this Gothic arch, arch material that you see here was in place. Instead, there was a heavy cornice that ran all around the building, just like inside a classical building. And the New York designers, as you can see, painted all kinds of lines on the ceiling to try and suggest that up there there were Gothic vaults. But it didn't work. It was a disaster. The progressive Methodists, and believe me, they were progressive, hired an architectural firm in Toronto, and in 1894 to 99, they tore out Mark Butcher's cornice, they tore out the fancy lines on the ceiling done by the New York designers, and they tried to add Gothic arches leaping over the windows in the way real Gothic does, and to have vaulting and they actually did vaulting in the corners of, of the balcony uh, in a quite marvelous way. And over 
where the original small organ was. And so this church was an attempt just before the turn of the century to Gothicize the interior so that it would match the exterior and the results were fantastic. It was also a time when stained glass was introduced into the church. The Methodists did not believe in organs. They did not believe in stained glass. They saw that as papist excess. But the great glorious window, the doxology window, was installed before the turn of the century. And early in the century, by about 1905, the Longworth family dedicated two great windows which are now on either side of the balcony where you can't see them. But that's not where they were meant to be. <clears throat> Sometimes I play around with Photoshop and I took the previous picture and as you can see on either side of the little organ that used to be here, the Longworth windows are in their original places flanking the organ and flooding you with their special light instead of being lost up in the balcony. And you can see the feeling in the church must have been different because instead of the, the massive organ pipes that we have now, colored light flooded the sanctuary. But within several years, there were plans for a bigger organ and you can see the movement of the windows. If you go and stand behind this church and look at the brickwork behind the sanctuary, it's worth a field trip in itself. You can study the movement of three sets of windows. The whole back is covered with window frames and brick. And so that is what was done. There were more developments during the Methodist period uh, the Hartz family built uh, the Hartz Memorial Hall in 1910. They used the architect Benjamin Chapel, who I think had a colossal ego and tried to overpower Trinity Church with his frighteningly massive and aggressive Hartz Memorial Hall. God may have been displeased with it. At some point or another, he got rid of it. Bricks and other things that were taken from Hart's Memorial Hall were used to build the present manse, a handsome, handsome building in a brick style. By 1925, the story ends. In the manuscript I produced called The Architecture of Methodism in Charlottetown, I tried to tell in considerable detail the story that I told you just now. And because when this became a Methodist church, the energy of the congregation, its plans for the beautification of the church like the majority of the stained glass windows that we see here, were mostly from the United Church period after 1925. And there were all kinds of educational activities on an amazing scale that put the province to shame and inspired other religious institutions to also try to work to educate the young. This is the story that I tell in this book, of which a few copies will be available after the service. It has been a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. I am deeply grateful for your invitation. I am deeply grateful that you accepted the manuscript that I produced and didn't reject it as the work of an outsider. And I hope that in the future, it will inspire you 
to discover in detail, know and love your sanctuary and the other sanctuaries that came before it. Praise be to God. That kind of talk always interests me because my first major was history at UPEI. So I found it all very interesting. Thank you so much. At birthday parties, we often express our joy and gratitude for the life of the person being honored. So on this 155th birthday, let us give thanks to God for the great gifts of those who have gone before us. Let us now offer our gifts for the work of this faith community here and throughout our world. Our morning offering will now be received. With gratitude, we honor the 155th birthday of this sacred place. We pray now blessing these offerings brought this day and the heritage of this faithful ministry which has taken place in this part of Christ's vineyard and far beyond. Bless this, our church, in its future with your deep grace and sensitive care for each other. For we ask all in your beloved name. Amen. The words of our prayers of the people is at, starts at the bottom of page four. Many years ago, this church was built for the faithful people living in this area. It has for all these years been a sanctuary dedicated to God and solid, solid in its knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ. Thank you, God of present, past, and future. 
Behind all activities at this church were the strong faith, determination, and long hours of hard work. All of these helped make it possible for this area to grow and for this church to flourish. Thank you, God, of past, present, and future. Over the years, worship and hymn books have changed and given us new ways of looking at our spiritual lives. As a result, our faith has been broadened and deepened, and we feel closer to a loving and personal God. Thank you, God of past, present, and future. Amen. And another hymn written by John Wesley, A Jesus Lover of My Soul, is found in your hymn book number 669. This is one of the most loved of Wesley's hymns in Newfoundland and Labrador. Interesting, the Connolly, Connolly of Newfoundland was to become the first mission ground of Methodism. 669. <laughs> Like those who went before us, each one of us has special talents and gifts with which to serve. Go from here now, discern your gifts, and share them with your neighbor, with your community, with the world, and with this community of faith, and do so with love and peace. Amen. Amen. 